Welcome to r slash today I effed up where people make terrible mistakes and post them on the internet so we can laugh at them. Earlier this year, Ancestry DNA had a sale on their kit. I thought it would be a great gift idea, so I bought six of them for Christmas presents. Today, my family got together to exchange presents for our Christmas Eve tradition, and I gave my mom, dad, brother, and two sisters each a kit. As soon as everyone opened their gift at the same time, my mom started freaking out. She told us how she didn't want us taking them because they had unsafe chemicals. We explained to her how there were actually no chemicals, but we could tell she was still flustered. Later, she started trying to convince us that only one of us kids need to take it since we will all have the same results and to resell extra kits to save money. Fast forward, our parents have been upstairs fighting for the past hour, and we are downstairs trying to figure out who has a different dad. Update. Thank you so much for all the love and support. My sisters, brother, and I have not yet decided if we are going to take the test. No matter what the results are, we will still love each other and our parents no matter what. Update number two. Christmas isn't ruined. My screw up actually turned into a Christmas miracle. Turns out my sister's father passed away shortly after she was born. A good friend of my mom's was able to help her through the darkest time in her life and they went on to fall in love and create the rest of our family. They have never told us because of how hard it was for my mom. Last night she was strong enough to share stories and photos with us for the first time and it truly brought us even closer together as a family. This is a Christmas we will never forget and yes we are all excited to get our test results. Merry Christmas everyone. P.S. Sorry, my mom isn't a whore. No, you're not my daddy. <laughs> I'm with everyone else. I thought I thought the mom was sneaking out. Oh, this is this is such a happier ending. I'm so glad. Recently, I traveled to Denver, Colorado with my wife and my wife's parents. As a resident of a non-legalized state, and as someone who is too much of a wussy to regularly buy illegal drugs, the thing I was looking forward to most was the chance to buy fancy legal weed. What could possibly go wrong? So the first thing I do upon arriving, and after successfully ditching the in-laws, is drag my wife to a nearby dispensary for a shopping spree. And oh my god, it was just like in my dreams. Tons of different options in neat little sample jars and a team of helpful stoners walking me through the various strains. Are you looking for a mellow body high? Or do you want something that gives you a bit more pep and energy? Or are you just hoping for something light to take the stress off? Yes, yes, and yes, I reply eagerly like a fat kid in a candy store and request an eighth ounce of about seven different options. In hindsight, if I learned anything from this experience, it is that my math and science teachers never taught me basic information like what is an ounce or how much weed can a person consume in a single weekend. Sure, I can tell you when two speeding trains leave separate stations will collide and recite Avogadro's number, but it turns out that none of that information is particularly relevant to getting high in a responsible and efficient manner. And it was at this dispensary that I also learned that you can't actually smoke in public places, including the hotel that my wife and I were staying at. As a result, before leaving, I begged my wife to buy some edibles that I could munch on until we found a place to properly get lit. After expressing shock as to the absurd volume of drugs that we were buying, unlike me, she is the product of private school and understands the imperial measurement system. She relents and we walk out of the store with what felt like a dump truck of weed plus a small package of seemingly innocuous ginger snap cookies. When we finally get back to the hotel room, I tear those bad boys open, only to find about a dozen tiny cookies roughly the size of a quarter? What the F, Denver? Seeing the skepticism and hunger in my eyes, my wife warns me that I should go easy and look at the back of the package first before trying one. Dose size, half a cookie, I read silently as I start taking micro bites from the edges like a giant chinchilla gnawing on a sunflower seed. But what kind of sa <laughs> But what kind of savage only eats half a cookie? So a second later, I covertly pop the remainder into my mouth. And then I quickly stuff another two cookies in my mouth for good measure the moment my wife turns her back. We may not have legal weed back home, but I routinely devour an entire package of Milano's in one sitting without breaking a sweat. Your move, tiny ginger snaps. About 30 minutes later, <laughs> oh man, I can already tell this story is going to be good. About 30 minutes later, we are in the back seat of her parents' rental car on the way to dinner, and that's when things start to go tits up. 
My stomach growls loudly and angrily. <laughs> My wife looks at me with inquisitive eyes that seem to say, diarrhea? But I merely clutch my tummy and mumble something about altitude sickness. <laughs> you didn't eat the whole cookie, did you? She asks, 10% in genuine concern and 90% in seething irritation. <laughs> of course not, I respond, avoiding eye contact for the remainder of the car ride. A few minutes later, we are climbing out of her parents' rental car and heading into some trendy farm-to-table restaurant. I don't, <laughs> I don't remember how I made it to my seat, and I don't remember ever looking at the menu, but I do remember the concerned look on the waiter's face as he asked me if I was doing all right. <laughs> Keep it together, man, I say to myself, but my wife's sudden groan suggests that I may have also said that to the waiter. <laughs> Things are going downhill fast. The waiter nods sympathetically, takes our, <laughs> takes our orders, and then heads to the next table. The moment he walks away, my wife is staring daggers at me. I start to, wor I start to worry that the jig is up. You are sweating from your entire face, she says with both pity and disgust, not quite knowing what to do. I, <laughs> I reach for my napkin and proceed to blot my cheeks, nose, neck, chin, and forehead. At this point, my wife's mom looks over at me with some concern. Are you all right? She asks kindly. Yeah, <laughs> the food's just a bit spicy. <laughs> I reply, far too quick to realize we had literally just ordered and there is nothing on the table except for a basket <laughs> of dinner rolls. My, my wife kicks me under the table to grab my attention. Bathroom, now, she hisses. Get it together. I reluctantly get up from the table and head for the toilet. After splashing several handfuls of water on my face, I approach a urinal and start to pee. Now, one of the more disconcerting effects of those tiny ginger snap monsters is the feeling that time has become untethered from reality. As I am peeing, I start to get the very unsettling feeling that I have been taking a piss for the better part of an hour and that my, <laughs> and that my wife must be pacing around the restaurant worried about me. <laughs> but deep down, I know that is absurd. I've been peeing all my life, sometimes multiple times a day. I've probably taken more than 50,000 leaks, and it usually only takes about a minute at most. So given that my typical pee is no more than 60 seconds, and given that it feels like I'm about halfway done, that, me that means that I've probably only been standing here for about 30 seconds, right? But the guy at the urinal next to me doesn't respond and instead starts shuffling away from me midstream like a startled penguin. I try, albeit unsuccessfully, to, to break eye contact. After finally finishing, I again splash some water on my face and return to my seat, making sure to apologize to the table for being gone such a long time, just, just in case my math was off. Next, I try briefly to engage, to engage in small talk with my wife's father, but I am far too high to, un to understand what either of us are saying. Not wanting to start laughing uncontrollably at the wrong moment, or really at any moment, I figure the safest idea is to nod my head periodically and drink a ton of water. Nothing cures mental fatigue like water, right? To my, to my wife's horror, I stand up, grab my water glass, and, and thrust it out to the waiter, who unfortunately is on the, opposite side, on the opposite side of the restaurant, but he turns out to be really cool and, after making his way over to our table, tells me that he'll do his best to keep me stocked with ice water for the rest of the meal. <laughs> He also helpfully suggests that if the dinner rolls aren't too spicy for me, I should probably eat one or two so that I'm not sitting there on an empty stomach. Smart man. However, after going through all of the bread on the table and three glasses of water, I start to get worried that I need actual food to offset the growing paranoia from those tiny ginger snap devils. Do you think I should flag down the waiter again and ask what's taken so long? I suggest helpfully to my wife. What? We literally just ordered three, three freaking minutes ago. And at that exchange, my wife loses her cool. How many cookies did you eat? She demands. Whoa there, easy Torquemada, I respond, somewhat horrified at her outburst. I had a few cookies, but keep it down. I don't want your parents to know how effed up I am right now. <laughs> really? They are sitting two feet away from you. They know. I look up and for the first time notice both of my in-laws just staring at me for what literally felt like an eternity.
That was a pretty good story, but it didn't go where I was hoping it would go. I was really hoping that he was going to accidentally leave the cookies around and the in-laws were going <laughs> and the in-laws were going to get into him. Oh, that would have been a delight to read. So there's this girl I like at work and we're really good friends. We're having lunch and we're making those ironic depression meme jokes as most friends do. For some reason, I, in my unknowingly stupid way to get her laugh, got the idea to say, well, hey, you know what's just one letter away from sad? Dab and promptly did the deed. Also, I have the ability to cry on demand, so I just stared stone cold at her and let two tears fall down. She finds it funny. Extremely funny. So funny she drops to the floor and starts laughing her butt off. After a good 30 seconds, she starts grabbing her chest and coughing. I asked if she was okay when she starts wheezing and begins to convulse a bit. Freaking the F out and thinking she's having a dang seizure, I start to reach for my phone. And in that exact second, my manager randomly decides to come in and sees this big guy towering over this poor little girl on the floor. I only managed to cut off her impending rage by saying I think she's having a seizure and I'm calling 911. Fortunately, I was able to explain to her what happened after the ambulance came. Turns out she has asthma and my joke caused a flare up and was waving her arms to try to tell me to get her inhaler. Whoops. If that girl had actually died from her asthma attack, then OP might have actually gone to jail for involuntary dab slaughter. I went to work today and turned my phone off as usual. I had almost 30 missed texts and calls from my pregnant wife when I turned it on. Most of them were asking how I could do this. I had no clue what she was talking about. She didn't answer any of my calls back. I got home and she was packing up to leave. I'll admit it, I cried a lot. Had no clue what was happening or what I did. Finally, it comes out that I texted her that I wanted a divorce. She showed me the text and I immediately realized what happened. This morning, a freestanding mirror for our bedroom was delivered. I texted her, the new mirror came in. I'm going to try and put it together, but I may need your help later. I had trouble putting it together and eventually gave up. I texted her, this isn't working. And at this point, I think I need to just give up. Apparently, the first text didn't go through, just the second one. So my pregnant wife panicked for a few hours while I was off thinking everything was great. She even called a divorce lawyer. Things are fine now, but she's still crying off and on. She told me we can laugh about it tomorrow. Just think about how differently the story could have ended. You think you can dump your pregnant wife? Well, right after you dumped me, I slept with your brother, so ha. So this happened about eight years ago in the sixth grade. Now, if you remember sixth grade, you know that trends fly in and out of style every other week. And just before Silly Bands took over as chief tween pimp currency, the big thing at my school was a trend we dubbed locker artillery. Basically, we gathered all the supplies we could from anywhere in the classrooms and created small projectile weapons from what we scavenged. We could use these weapons to lob erasers, spitballs, and paper hornets at ourselves and unsuspecting teachers. Eventually, things got out of hand. It became a grade-wide arms race to create the ultimate launching machine. Heists were performed on teachers' desks. Books were destroyed and scrapped for ammunition. Students presented welts from paper hornets with the same pride one would display a hickey from a cheerleader. Rubber bands were contraband. It was full-on Mad Max magic school bus adventure. Here's where the F up started. One night I was sitting on my bed, tinkering with various supplies, when it finally hit me. The secret is not the launcher, but the ammo. Spitballs were too light, hornets were too restricting, and erasers were inaccurate. I needed something aerodynamic. So my sociopath 11-year-old brain decided that the inkwell of a pen would do nicely. I'll cover the tip with an eraser. What could go wrong? I thought to myself. Let me tell you, the next day I created the ultimate cannon, utilizing no less than seven rubber bands, a pin barrel, two springs, and a binder clip for a trigger. With the inkwell loaded, I felt like a small, sexually frustrated MacGyver with intent to kill. On my bus, my friend, let's call him Neo, was extremely interested in my device and asked for a demonstration. I obliged and fit the eraser to the end of the ammo. Neo opened the bus window and told me to aim outside the window and hit the school wall. We were still parked at the school at this time. I aimed, pulled back, and fired. All I saw was the eraser flying off the inkwell before I heard an extremely sudden crack. 
I looked forward and there was a hole in the double pane window of the bus, only an inch or two from Neo's head. My parents had to pay for the window. Neo's parents didn't let me over to his house until senior year. The principal cracked down on locker artillery and suspended anyone, including myself for three days, who dare use a pen for anything other than writing. But I still won that arms race. It all makes sense. Now we know where Neo learned how to dodge bullets. That was r slash today I effed up and our lives are filled with so many mistakes. So please avoid making a terrible mistake by closing this video without subscribing. Hit the subscribe button, like the video and comment down below because if you like this content, it really does help me out.